picture yourself in Iowa in the year 1900. You have no radio. There is a radio. This is a radio from the early 1920s. Look how far we've come with that. You certainly have no television. This is like the first television my folks had in the early 1950s. You might have a parlor piano. Your family might also have a Victrola, an immensely popular device for entertainment. You have no movies yet. And the automobile hasn't quite arrived. So what am I trying to say? My point is that people lack the huge variety of entertainment that we now have. Today, we've got so many entertainment, travel, and shopping options, that is pre-COVID, that we don't know which to choose. Now let's go back even further to the early 1800s in America. The Lyceum Movement was founded in 1826 by a Josiah Holbrook. It sponsored public and entertainment. Holbrook saw education as a lifelong experience. In 1834, there were 3,000 lyceums that put on lectures, debates, and concerts. The lyceum movement reached the peak of its popularity in the antebellum era. Noted lecturers, entertainers, and readers would journey from place to place to entertain, speak, or debate. Lyceums educated the adult American and were very popular, especially during winter nights. The Lyceum movement began to fade, but another medium soon followed, one that attracted huge audiences. In 1874, two gentlemen organized a movement in Western New York to train Sunday school teachers in the organization, management, and teaching of Sunday schools. John Vincent was a Methodist minister, and Lewis Miller was a businessman. The educational summer camp that they founded would become known as the Chautauqua, and later as the Mother Chautauqua, because many daughter Chautauquas would spin off. We can see that Chautauqua County is at the western edge of New York State. Within the county is Chautauqua Lake, along which is the city of Chautauqua. It was in this area that the Chautauqua was founded. It's perhaps an Iroquois word meaning a bag tied in the middle or two moccasins tied together and is descriptive of the shape of Chautauqua Lake. In 1874, the first Chautauqua assembly was held led by Bishop Vince Vincent. It was called the Sunday School Teachers Assembly, and it was like a summer camp. In later years, hotels, clubhouses, lecture halls, and permanent summer homes were built, and the assembly assumed a permanent character, providing a blend of religion, recreation, and education. In 1879, the Chautauqua lasted for 43 days. By 19, or 1890, Independent Chautauquas were held in practically all parts of the country. In 1894, there were 80 independent Chautauqua assemblies utilizing 3,000 entertainers, providing humorous, educational, and inspirational programming. It was because everyone could not travel to New York for the assemblies that these daughter Chautauquas were established and were usually located near a lake or wooded area with camping facilities. By 1890, they were established practically all over the United States, but they had the largest presence in the Midwest. In time, the daughter Chautauquas dropped the greater part of the remaining traces of the religious influence and became almost entirely secular. And there were children's programs included in the assemblies. It was rural America that especially welcomed Chautauquas. Up until the 1890s, each assembly bargained on its own for its talent. Then realizing the need for efficiency, some organization was needed. The cost of routing talent to the scattered independent Chautauquas became a serious issue. Keith Vauter, a native of Iowa, 
created independent assemblies and in the process created the circuit or tent Chautauqua. Water launched the first circuit Chautauqua in the summer of 1904. Among the many persons and groups comprising the talent in these assemblies were widely known individuals. William Jennings Bryan. You have become the most popular of all the Chautauqua speakers. He was an American orator and politician, dominant in the populist wing of the Democratic Party. He stood three times as the party's candidate for the presidency of the United States in 1896, 1900, and 1908, and also served in various positions in national government. Brian liked food, lots of food, but his passion was for radishes, and he carried bunches of them around in his pocket, together with the salt cellar. He always appeared on the platform fanning himself with a big palm leaf fan. He would often be accompanied by a boy carrying a block of ice. During his speech, he would rest his hand on the ice, and as his bald head began to glow, he would give it a cooling caress with his icy hand. Brian had an evangelistic and a populist message. He was a devout Presbyterian, a supporter of prohibition, and an opponent of Darwinism. He attacked Clarence Darrow and Darwinism and evolution in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial of 1895 and died five days after the verdict was rendered. Here he's shown with Darrow. The first Iowa City Chautauqua was held in 1906 and ran for 10 days on the grounds of present day Manville Heights. One, on one of the days, 3,000 people packed an immense tent. By this time with Chautauquas, the balance between education and entertainment it shifted in favor of entertainment. Bearing in mind that the population of Iowa City at the time was just over 8,000, a crowd of 3,000 was remarkable. Here's a picture showing the big tent in Manville Heights. In 1906, interurban trains carried many carloads of people to the Chautauqua grounds. With the capacity of 2,500 in the tent, many were forced to stand. One orator spoke for nearly two hours in the stifling head of heat of July in 1906, while a crowd of 2,000 listened. An Iowa City newspaper reported that, quote, nobody left the audience for the entire time. In Iowa City, stores all over town closed between 1.30 and 4 p.m on at least one of the Chautauqua days. Another colorful character who appeared at the Iowa City Chautauqua called himself Professor Pamahasica, described as America's most successful animal and bird educator. He gave a program emphasizing the human treatment of domestic animals. His companions included Australian white cockatoos, Australian rosa cockatoos, Brazilian giant macaws, Japanese fantail pigeons, canaries, house cats, including Persians and angoras, puddle dogs, fox terriers, common dogs, and monkey comedians. One of the professor's dramatic acts featured a battle in which the birds fired cannon, and when the fort burst into flames, the fire company responded, raised ladders, turned over a water tank and extinguished the fire. The Iowa City Chautauquas were not circuit Chautauquas, but were known as independent Chautauquas. As such, talent was not dictated for Iowa City through an agency such as the Water Circuit Chautauqua group that I mentioned. Communities using the circuit Chautauqua system were told what talent would be included in a package price and on what days each entity would perform. However, the sponsoring bureau's name was not mentioned in the programs, thereby giving the illusion that the local town had control over the programming. In 1926, 27, and 28, though, Iowa City did partner with Chautauqua agencies to procure some of the talent that was used. 
1914, there were many Chautauqua companies engaged in circuit operations, and they provided programs to 2,400 towns all around the U.S. The biggest year for circuit Chautauqua was 1924, when 10,000 communities had an estimated 40 million people in attendance. But following that year, the demand for circuit Chautauqua diminished abruptly. This is how a seven day circuit Chautauqua worked requiring nine tents. It allowed the tent crew two days to tear down, travel and set up the tent again in the next place nine towns away. As the last program was given on the seventh day, the big canvas was taken down and shipped ahead to the 10th town. When the Chautauqua closed in town number two, tent number two was transported to town number 11. This leapfrog process went on to the end of the circuit. Here is the 1927 schedule of Red Path Water seven day circuit that included 19 towns in Iowa over just a three week span. Included many very small towns. Starting in North Central Iowa, up at the top here, here is how the circuit zigzagged through Western Iowa and finished down here in South Central Iowa. It was a highly organized production. They had front people going ahead to establish things. They hired college people to run the shows and administer different things, sell tickets and so forth. Very, very highly organized, very refined. A typical Red Path water circuit ran from late May to mid-September involving about 100 towns. A standard Chautauqua tent was 80 feet by 120 feet, able to seat about 1,000 people. Temperatures inside the tent could reach over 100, and on an elevated stage was lighting over 110. When the demand exceeded the capacity, some were forced to sit outside the perimeter of the tent. From its beginning until about 1925, Circuit Chautauqua was always built around five types of general features, namely lectures, dramatic arts, music, funny shows, and children's activities. Agencies such as Red Path Water had enough circuits that they could avoid bringing the same talent to the same circuit two or more years in a row. However, immensely popular talent such as William Jennings Bryan never seemed to tire the same audiences. Between July 1st and August 31st of 1915, Bryan made 33 speeches at different Chautauquas while serving as Secretary of State under President Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. The chairs were hauled between cities using large wagons and teams of horses. The talent would travel by train when possible. Often performers had to change trains during the night, spending hours in depots between trains. They might sleep on depot benches and train seats. There was no time off, not for holidays or days between engagements. Popular entertainers faced anywhere from six to 20 weeks of solid booking were up to 140 consecutive daily appearances. Iowa City held Chautauquas from 1906 through 1928, and each program was held in July or August. Many attendees saw their first movies in tents. More importantly, the Chautauqua experience stimulated thought and discussion on the important political, social, and cultural issues of the day. The orator spoke to large crowds without the benefit of amplification. <coughs> Here's a colorful figure, Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation, seen here in the 1860s, appeared in the 1910 Iowa City Chautauqua. She was a radical member of the temperance movement and she opposed alcohol long before the advent of prohibition in the United States. After she led a raid in Wichita, her husband joked that she should use a hatchet next time for maximum damage. She replied, that is the most sensible thing you have sensed since I married you. 
Between the years 1900 and 1910, she was arrested some 30 times for her hatchetations, as she came to call them. She paid her jail fines from lecture fees and the sale of souvenir hatchets. She was a relatively large woman standing six feet tall and weighing 175 pounds. She has described herself as a, quote, bulldog running along at the feet of Jesus, barking at what he doesn't like, unquote. And she claimed a divine ordination to promote temperance by destroying saloons. Mrs. Nation spoke to a crowd of some 2,000 in Iowa City. Here were some of her comments offered at the 1910 Chautauqua. Boozing, hey? Cut it out, young man, before it kills you and sends your soul straight to hell. Eyeing a cigar smoker, she said, huh? Wasting your time and money? Hell for you. Now something about attendance figures, locations, and ticket prices of Iowa City Chautauqua. At the 1906 and 1908 Iowa City Chautauquas, up to 3,000 attended certain single events. Many camped on the grounds during the multi-day sessions. Iowa City's tent city of 1908 contained 133 tents with 300 campers. Campers also often engaged in boating, horseshoe pitching, and baseball. Here we see the Howell family packed up with their supplies to last 10 days for camping. Perhaps the namesake of Howell Street. Newspaper reports told of good audiences throughout the years of Chautauqua and Iowa City. On especially hot days, attendance would suffer, but the programs held their own. However, the Iowa City Daily Press reported dismal news for the 1910 Chautauqua. Bad weather took its toll, principally in the form of heavy rains. Loss followed loss. The same thing occurred during the 1915 program, with cold rains plaguing most of the program. Often the big tents could be damaged by storms, but could be patched. Sometimes a major tent collapse would occur. These are the ticket prices in 1909 and 1910. Of course, we have to put that into those dollars. Here are some colorful Iowa City Chautauqua tickets. Children were taught songs, directed in simple pageants, and participated in other organized play. Some babysitting services were also available to free up the adults for their programs. Here are the dates of the first Iowa City Chautauquas. And here are the dates of the last events. The first Iowa City Chautauquas were held in the Manville Heights area. After Manville Heights began to develop, the grounds were moved to Folsom Heights, the site on which West Lawn and the College of Nursing building now stand. And the final grounds for the Iowa City Chautauqua programs were those of present day College Green Park, part of which was then known as College Hill Park. After the last Iowa City Chautauqua was held, it was proposed that a suitable marker be established and placed in College Hill Park in memory of the Chautauqua movement. A bronze tablet was placed on a main drinking fountain with these words, Iowa City Chautauqua, 1906 to 1928. This fountain erected in commemoration of Chautauqua, one of the great moral and educational institutions of America. As I walked around the park, I found no evidence of that marker. No doubt the fountain was replaced and wasn't, the marker probably wasn't dealt with. This scene depicts a group of men and women who were camping on one of the Chautauqua grounds. Here's a family camping. One of the many programs that are kept in the special collections area of the University of Iowa Library. Picnickers at a Chautauqua. 
perhaps a makeshift ticket booth or an outhouse. A couple of official programs. And finally, a group of entertainers. Were the Iowa City Chautauquas profitable? The short answer is no. Some made a little money and many lost money, but their stated aim was not to make a profit, but they needed to meet expenses. Originally stock was sold in 1906 at $10 a share. The Iowa City program struggled throughout their existence to secure adequate finances to carry on their assemblies. And the challenge became more difficult as years passed. For example, for the first assembly in 1906, expenses were $3,300, including the cost of $1,750 for talent. The receipts were only $2,630. The board found it necessary to borrow up to $750. The years 1906 through 1916 saw successive failures. Extremely warm weather, rainy weather, and dusty roads were all blamed. Finally, when Chautauqua was discontinued in Iowa City after the 1928 assembly, there was a bank balance of only about $200. Whether success or failure financially, Chautauqua remained strong into the 1920s, and Iowa led the nation in the number of Chautauqua programs in the year 1920. To illustrate the widespread existence of Chautauqua in Iowa, here is just a partial listing of the towns in which Chautauquas were held in the eastern part of our state. And here's a pictorial representation of this. What were the reasons for the decline of Chautauqua in America by the late 1920s? Author Robert A. McCowan cites these things. Perhaps one of the main reasons for the end of the movement was the vast increase in oversupply in the number of Chautauquas. Every small town had to have its own Chautauqua for three days at least. As the number of Chautauquas increased, the balance between education and entertainment on the program shifted towards entertainment and the quality decreased. Secondly, America was changing its image. The small town, the little red schoolhouse, evangelistic Christianity and William Jennings Bryan were losing their grip. The isolation of the middle border was over and Americans were introduced to rural free delivery, mail order catalogs, hard surface roads, automobiles and trucks. Rural electrification, the telephone, radio, talking motion pictures, golf courses, and summer vacation trips. And last, economic factors probably played a role. Rural areas fell under hard times in the 1920s, and then after the Great Depression ensuing in 1929, a final end to the circuits came. A quote from an article in the Palimpsest, whereas as many as 47 independents operated in Iowa in 1906, only a handful of Iowa community assemblies, independent and circuit alike, continued as long as Clarinda's, I think it was 1932. Minneapolis, which maintained an assembly into the mid 1940s, claims to have been the last Chautauqua west of the Mississippi. Nationally, the decline was similar. In 1920, approximately 25 Chautauqua bureaus managed nearly 100 circuits. In 1932, only four bureaus managed five circuits. When Chautauqua finally died out in Iowa, all 99 counties had held programs. So what remains of Chautauqua today? The University of Iowa has perhaps the most extensive collection of papers, records, and photos concerning Chautauqua in the country. Harrison Thornton, a professor of history at Iowa, was largely responsible for the start of the collection. And here's Robert Hedges, who spent one year 
sorting and classifying materials that were donated to the university. University Heights has staged a one day Chautauqua like event in recent years. There is a small town of Western Illinois, Bishop Hill, which also puts on a show. There are others scattered here and there. I discovered an entity called Chautauqua Trail. You can see that there are many sites where Chautauqua is trying for a revival in various parts of the country. You can check it out by going to this website. It appears that the programming in Petoskey, Michigan runs for a couple of months. At least it did in, in 2016. We can still see much evidence of, of the remains of Chautauqua by way of road signs and park signs. Here are just a few examples. Some built these pavilions rather than doing them and holding them in tents. Mother Chautauqua still goes on in Western New York, thriving there today as the Chautauqua Institution, which is a nonprofit adult education center and summer resort. It's located on 750 acres. Here is what is included in the programming. <clears throat> Offerings in the arts, education, religion, and recreation, popular entertainment, theater, symphony, ballet, opera, and visual arts exhibitions. There's also a school of special studies, a residential music program of intensive study for students aiming for professional careers, those who audition for admittance into Chautauqua schools of fine and performing arts. Mother Chautauqua has been visited by United States presidents from Ulysses S. Grant to Bill Clinton and other prominent Americans such as Booker T. Washington and Carl Menninger. Facilities on the institution grounds include a 6,000 seat amphitheater, administrative offices, a library, a movie theater, a bookstore, hotels, condominiums, inns, rooming houses, and many private cottages. There are about 400 year-round residents, but in the summer, the population can be up to 10,000 at a time. The Athenaeum Hotel is the only hotel actually owned and operated by the institution. It's a 156-room structure built in 1881, said to be the largest wooden building in the Eastern United States. Here's information about the 2016 summer session. Clear Lake, Iowa established one of the earliest three daughter Chautauquas in the United States and did so in 1876, only two years after Mother Chautauqua was created. After the Chautauquas had their run, they reached upwards of 65 million people in their collective audiences. Theodore Roosevelt called it, quote, the most American thing in America. Woodrow Wilson described it during World War I as, quote, an integral part of the national defense. In contrast, Sinclair Lewis called it nothing but wind and chaff and the laughter of yokels. And William James found it depressing from its mediocrity. Iowa was probably the leader in the nation in having the most independent Chautauquas. And in 1920, the state of Iowa held more Chautauquas by far than any other state. In 1944, the Minneapolis Chautauqua, the last surviving one in Iowa, disappeared. A book by John Tapia, which I read, sums things up this way. The Chautauqua journey bridged the gap between 19th and 20th century attitudes about education and entertainment nourished a national ideology, and readied the nation for electronic mass media entertainment. <laughs>